Good morning, church. Good morning. Woo! Um, and good morning to those who are worshiping online. Um, yeah, I'm stoked to be here. Uh, it's spring break for us, the youth, and so we're fired up. Um, and in Young Life, we do this thing um, during spring break. We give the leaders a break from our organized clubs and leader meetings and stuff like that that we do. And we just encourage them just to go in the community and be with teenagers. And it's one of my favorite parts of the year because we just go do what they want. They're all free and they have so much time. They just want to like go do some wild stuff. And we just do it with them. And that's a part of what we do with Young Life. We just walk alongside with them. And so I thought I'd share a little bit of like what we're doing with the youth uh, over spring break. So yeah, I got some announcements um, for ooh, the Easter stuff. Okay, there'll be a special wor worship service at the church on Good Friday, April 7th at 10.30 a.m. And on Easter Sunday, April 9th, after our Easter morning service, there will be a congregational brunch prepared for us by the church council. Thank you, church council, for food. So mark it on your calendar and plan to attend this special morning at Elk Lake Baptist. Um, ooh, the Ukrainian Settlement Committee wanted to extend a big thank you um, who are, to those who like, help provide household items uh, for our Ukrainian family that's coming. Uh, there's a list on the bulletin board in the foyer of items that needed still. And if you have any questions, please call Linda Crotty. And you'll find her telephone number on today's bulletin in the email mail out uh, that was sent out this morning. Uh, the committee is looking to receive donations during the month of March, and the Jeripa family will be arriving on Victoria on March 29th. So that's exciting. Uh, please pray for them as they prepare to move to Canada. So yeah, our call to worship is from Psalm 78. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from old, from old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statues of Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born. And they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would, they would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation, whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirit were not faithful to him. Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you, God, for that we get to worship here. We invite you in today to our presence. Let's, let us freely worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Alan. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 648. So if you look at the pew in front of you, there's a blue hymnal. It's number 648, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Would you please stand with us as we sing together?
please be seated. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. And we come here today seeking your grace. For most merciful God, we know that it is you who have given us your only begotten Son, who died for us. And therefore we ask that you would have mercy on us and for his sake forgive us all our sins. By your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and your will, and also true obedience to your word, so that by your grace we may come to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul wrote that God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And he went on later in the letter to say, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so, my brothers and sisters in Christ, may you now be assured of God's forgiveness of all of your sin on account of your faith in the saving work of Jesus Christ God has shown you his love. He has washed you and made you clean. Amen. I'd like the worship team to come forward. You did pen. Uh, now it's time for... Uh, the prayers of our community. So this is our opportunity to bring forward our thanksgivings to God, any requests for his intercession in our lives, uh, and any words of encouragement that the Lord might have given you through the week, either in prayer or through something that you witnessed that he did, uh, you might share to encourage your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, so at this time, I invite you to just raise your hand from where you're seated and share one of those three things. Yeah. All right, let's pray. Would you please bow with me? Heavenly Father, we come to you this day, and we recognize that it is not on account of anything uh, that we have done for you, but it's on account of the fact that you first loved us in your Son, Jesus Christ, and came and took our place while we were still sinners, so that we might be cleansed through faith in your Son, Jesus Christ, and might be adopted into your family. And now, having been adopted as your sons and daughters, we bring to you our Father in heaven, our requests and our thanksgivings, and we ask that you would hear our prayers. So, Heavenly Father, we want to give thanks. ...in her Bible study group. We thank you that you give us brothers and sisters who walk alongside of us and remind us of who you are and what you are doing and what you will do. So we thank you for all of this in the name of Jesus Christ who loves us. In his name we pray. Amen. All right. I would now like to invite Ruth to come and read scripture. Scripture this morning is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. One of my faves. <laughs> so, read along with me, 2 Timothy chapter 4. In the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage 
with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers who say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. They will, uh, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we, we do ask that your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, would come. We ask that we also would be ready to receive him at his coming. For we recognize that he is the judge. And we are so thankful for that. We are so thankful that you've taken the task of judging. Well, it's never been in our hands. It's always been in your hands. And you are a good judge. And we look forward to the day when you will reward all of those who have put their faith in you and that you will make things right in the world again. And in the meantime, Father, we pray that you'd open our minds and our hearts to hear and understand your word so that we might even now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, live in line with the kingdom that is coming so that in your grace and mercy, we would both taste for ourselves and be a foretaste to others of the goodness that is promised through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask this in his name. Amen. Racing. What do you picture in your mind when you hear the word racing? Perhaps you're in, you picture a marathon runner or a sprinter. Perhaps you imagine a race car ripping down the track. Maybe it's cycling or swimming or skating. But whatever form it takes, there is something that all racing shares in common. A finish line. Right? No matter how or when a race may start, every race has a finish line. And here in chapter 4 of Paul's second letter to Timothy, Paul uses the image of a race as a metaphor for his whole life. And then he surprisingly describes himself as already having crossed the finish line. In verse 7 we read, he sent him writing, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race. In fact, the phrase which is translated um, right before that, I have fought the good fight, is more literally, I have competed in the good contest. The contest could, yes, very well be applied to a battle, uh, but it could also be applied to um, an athletic event, like in the ancient Olympic events. So wrestling, running on your race on foot. Um, but seeing as Paul then goes on in verse 8, uh, to name the prize that comes from an athletic event, the crown. So this isn't like a king's crown, this is like the laurel wreath that an ancient uh, athlete would wear once they had won their event. Um, so the crown is an athletic image. Uh, it, I would say it's probably best for us to stick with this athletic metaphor rather than slipping into the battle one so much. But either way, Paul is describing his life for sure, at least as a race. And now, after 30 years or more as a missionary to the Gentiles, Paul is declaring, I have finished the race. I have crossed the finish line, he's saying. But what is the finish line? I mean, as close as Paul may be to dying, he's not dead yet, right? Like, he isn't. So why is he talking like this? How can he speak of his race as a completed action in the past as something he's finished? 
Well, he makes that clear at the end of verse 7. So at the beginning, he speaks of this uh, competing in a contest, uh, and then he goes on to describe this contest as a race that is now finished, and the final thing he says, clarifying what he means by the race being finished, is, I have kept the faith. I've kept the faith. That is the true finish line for life. Death is not the finish line. Everyone dies. And there is no reward, no victory for simply arriving at the point of our own death. The finish line is to keep the, keep the faith and to keep it all the way to the end. This is what he's claiming. That the goal of our lives is not to live a long life or to live a good life or to live a fun life. The goal of life is to keep the faith it is the one who keeps the faith who wears the crown, whose life, no matter how short, hard, or boring it may seem in the eyes of the world, will in the end be victory. The goal of life is to keep the faith. But what then does it mean to keep the faith? Well, the surrounding context makes it clear that it means at least two things, two things. First, keeping the faith means remaining faithful to Jesus all the way to the end, even to our death. As Paul writes later in verse 8, it is the Lord, the righteous judge, who will reward me on that day. That is, on the day of final judgment, the end. And it is the same thought that begins this passage in verse 1 of chapter 4, which reads, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing or coming and his kingdom, I give you this charge. So Jesus is the final judge who is coming and will judge everyone, both those who are living at his arrival and those, all those who have died before his coming. And you know what? Jesus' judgment here is presented as a good thing. The only thing that's described about it is presenting this crown, this reward, this victory, the crown of righteousness to all those who have kept the faith, who have been faithful to Jesus all the way to the end. So the first thing about keeping the faith is being faithful to Jesus to the end. But second, and I think particularly important in this case to Paul, it also means preaching or communicating the gospel without any corruption or change. This is part of Paul's big concern for Timothy. Not only that Timothy be bold in preaching the gospel, but unlike all these many false teachers he just, he's describing who are willing to change the gospel to tickle the fancies of their listeners' ears, Paul commands Timothy to stay faithful to the message that he had received. He urges Timothy to preach the word of God, not his own words. So second, keeping the faith means staying faithful to the gospel as it was given through Jesus Christ and the apostles chosen by him. So then, the metaphor is this, that life is a race. And like every race, it has a finish line. And that finish line is to keep the faith. That is to stay faithful to Jesus all the way to the end and to stay faithful to the gospel as it was given by God. That's the goal that we're striving for. Now, Paul is, at least in ancient terms, old by this point in his life. He knows that even if God saves him from death at the hands of the Roman emperor, he still probably doesn't have a whole lot of time left. But what he does know is that he has kept the faith, that he's finished the race. But the next question is this, why is Paul telling this to Timothy? Right, Timothy's not old, Timothy's young. Why is he going on and on about finishing his race and this goal? Is he bragging, is he showing off? Not at all. Well, what is he doing then? Well, he's showing Timothy that the race we run as Christians is never an individual event. It's always a relay. See, my guess is that when I began by talking about racing, you imagined a race that ends with crossing the finish line. And isn't that how most of us think of life? At least I know I've slipped into that thing of thinking often, that when I cross the finish line, typically I think of when I die and I'm taken to be with Christ, the race is over, right? I think, I, I still slip into thinking like this often, but this can't be the kind of race that Paul has in mind. Paul recognizes that the race isn't just him, that there's other people, people after him, it's a relay. 
Even though Paul has come to the end of his race and even says he's finished it, he's standing at the finish line and looking to the person who is going to take up the baton after him and run after him. His concern is for his son in the faith, Timothy. How many of you have ever watched uh, short track speed skating in the Winter Olympics? Anybody? Okay, pretty good crew of you. Have you ever watched one of the relay races in short track speed skating? It's pretty cool. If you haven't, you should like YouTube it and watch it later. Um, but for those of you who haven't, um, the racers are whipping around this small, like basically arena at crazy speeds. And the next person in the race, they come up behind them and they actually push them. And they transfer their momentum on to the next person in the race. This, I think, is essentially what Paul is trying to do for Timothy. And this is what I think Paul expects all believers to do for each other. You see, Paul finishes verse 8, the closing of this passage, by saying that the victory that he's going to enter into, the crown of righteousness that he will wear, belongs not only to me, but also to all who have longed for Christ's appearing. In other words, it's a shared victory. It's a team race. And when you're racing as a team, your concern is never only for yourself. When you're racing as a team, you care about how the person after you will do. And I got to witness this dramatically recently. Uh, as some of you might know, my daughters are into competitive swimming, and as a swim dad, uh, I have to help out with officiating at swim meets. And a, a few weeks ago, I was helping as a timer at the U Sports Finals. So this is the championship event for all universities in Canada. And there were a lot of people there, and there was a lot of cheering. It was very loud. But when it came time for the relay race events, it was deafeningly loud. Like, deafeningly loud. And this makes sense. Because in a relay, all the people involved care very much, a lot more than they usually do, about the other racers in the pool and how they're racing. And they are not shy about expressing their encouragement to the other racers on their team, to the people who are racing after them. And my brothers and sisters, this is how it should be in the church also. Yes, we face opposition from the world. Suffering and shame, as we've been learning through Timothy, will come our way on account of keeping the faith on account of being faithful to Jesus and the gospel. And because of that, I think this is what Paul's getting at, it's easy to let our concerns simply become just about us making it through. About just, I just need to get across the finish line. Just get myself over the line. But when Paul found himself at the finish line, his attitude wasn't, Phew, I made it. <sighs> He was looking ahead, right? He was looking to Timothy, his son in the faith, and he was vigorously cheering him on. Standing at the finish line of faith, Paul was screaming cheers of encouragement to the next runner in the race. Thus it is that this passage gives two challenges to us who are believers in Jesus Christ. There are two words here for us, a different one depending on your age. First, there is a word to young believers. The word that Paul sums up in the last words he writes in verse 5, where he commands Timothy to discharge all of your duties. To, pardon me, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Note that Paul does not command Timothy to do the duties of someone else's ministry, right? Paul makes it clear that God has given each Christian a ministry, a way that he has called that person to serve him. And this is why Paul's very first command in this letter to Timothy, back in chapter 1, verse 6, was fan into the flame the gift of God that's within you. He wants you to exercise those gifts, to use them. So therefore, to those of you who are young, God's words to you is that he has given each one of you a special gift by the power of his Holy Spirit. And he wants you to use it. He wants you to rise up and to use the gifts that he's given. So young people, you are to fight against the deception of our culture, which encourages you to push off responsibility as long as possible in order to maximize leisure time in your life. You instead are under orders from Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead, which is pretty sobering. But this is meant for a good thing, to judge us in order to give us victory. 
to give victory to everyone who pursues the goal of keeping the faith in carrying out the ministry that God has given to you to do. Now, of course, in hearing that, you may have questions like, well, what are the gifts that God has given to me, right? Like, I'm not sure I know what they are. Or questions about like, okay, I think I know what some of them might be, but I'm not sure how to best use them or when to use them. And you know, these questions are natural and good. And we will address some of those questions uh, not too long from now. We're gonna do a series on spiritual gifts a little bit later in the spring. Um, and because those are good questions and we know they're good questions because Paul assume, assumed Timothy had them too We see this in the specific instructions that he gives to Timothy about his giftings He tells Timothy and all those gifted with the gifts of preaching teaching or evangelism that their tool is the word of God That's what he's to preach He's not to rely on clever arguments or stats from some other field of human knowledge to convince people about the gospel. Preaching, teaching, and evangelism is about communicating God's words, not our own. But Paul also recognized that the preacher, teacher, or evangelist needs to connect God's word to other people's lives in relevant ways, ways that actually connect and apply. This is why Paul says in verse 2 of chapter 4, he says, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So we need to think clearly about whether the word of God needs to be used to help correct or to help rebuke or to help encourage. As John Stott writes, some people are tormented by doubts and they need to be convinced, corrected by arguments from scripture. Others have fallen into sin and need to be rebuked. Others are haunted by fears and need to be encouraged. God's word does all this and more. We are to apply it relevantly. Now, some of you young believers here have been given gifts of teaching, preaching, or evangelism. These instructions here are especially for you. But even if you haven't been given those gifts, Paul's overall thrust is still the same. No matter what the gifts that God has given you may be, you are all called to do your ministry in season and out of season. That is, when it's convenient and when it's not convenient. You are all called to use your gifts to serve God with great patience and with careful attention. Whether that's in exercising God-given faith to pray for the healing and transformation of others, in serving the poor, or in giving generously, or in what other, whatever other gifting it may be. God inspired the Apostle Paul to write boldly at the end of his life to charge you to stand up and do it. Go for it. Think of this. Paul is there filled with the Holy Spirit of God, inspired, and is standing at the finish line cheering you on. That's what he's doing here. And that brings us then to the second word of challenge that comes from this passage. The challenge that is for those believers who are old. <laughs> that way. The challenge to speak up and vigorously cheer on the generations of believers that come after you. If you are approaching the end of your race, do not be content to simply cross the, cross the finish line in quietness. Give a charge to the next person in line ready to run their race. Be like the speed skater who pushes the next racer, passing your momentum onto them. This is particularly the case with those young believers who share the same spiritual gifts as the ones God gave to you. The reason why Paul calls Timothy his son is not because Paul was Timoth Timothy's biological father. Paul was not Timothy's biological dad. Paul calls Timothy his son because he recognized that God had given Timothy the same spiritual gifts that had been given to him. Just like Paul had lived faithfully and fruitfully as a called preacher, teacher, and evangelist, Paul recognized those same giftings of God in Timothy. And that's what made him Timothy, Timothy his son. And so my elder brothers and sisters in Christ, God has given each one of you 
spiritual sons and daughters. He has given you Christian young people who are gifted with the same kind of spiritual gifts you have been given. And God longs for you to seek out your sons and daughters in the faith and to cheer them on from the finish line. You see, Paul did not wait for Timothy to find him. Paul met Timothy and he recognized God's gifts in Timothy, and he laid his hands on Timothy, and he pursued Timothy, and at the end of his life, when he was on death row, not knowing if he would live the next day, he wrote a bold letter to Timothy to encourage him in his own hour of need. You see, just as our time on earth is limited, we must face the fact that no matter how we reach the end of our race, Our ability to exercise the gifts that God has given us in the way we once had is limited and it will come to an end. As we see the finish line approaching the day when we will be forced to lay down our instruments and our talents with which we have served our Lord God thus far in our lives, will come to a close and we must not allow ourselves to be overcome by grief or self-pity in that hour. Why? Because the race we're running is not an individual event. It's a team event. It is a relay. And no matter how old you may be, you can always cheer on your sons and daughters in the faith. And Paul's example challenges us to do that and to do it vigorously, with passion. In other words, don't wait for young people to call you. You call them. Don't wait for young people to figure things out on their own. You, as the elder Christian, take the initiative to pour out the time and effort to get to know young people and to bless and encourage the ones coming after you. And in so doing, may you be given the same encouragement and confidence from God that Paul had as he was doing it. You see, in Paul, in speaking of his own approaching death, in verse 6 of chapter 4, writes, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. Paul describes the approach of imminent death as the pouring out of a drink offering. His life is almost over. The last moments of life on this earth are being poured out, but that pouring out, his metaphor shows, is a purposeful pouring out. It has meaning. It has significance. It is an offering to the Most High God. Paul is locked up in prison and literally cannot go out anywhere. He can't go to church. He can't preach to other people. He's stuck in a cell. And yet he recognizes the things that he can do. The fact that he can still offer prayers for Timothy and others, as he tells us at the beginning of the letter. And the fact that he can still write this letter. And he recognizes that even this little bit at the end of his life is all part of the same offering that he's been doing his whole life long, even though it's the last bits a pouring of the cup. So it is God, my brothers and sisters, that gives life purpose. It is not how fantastic or amazing our abilities may be at the time. No matter how old you get or how limited your abilities may be, offer God what you have, and he will make it meaningful. He will make you into a drink offering poured out on his altar. And as Paul approaches death, he also time of my departure is near, which is a very interesting image. The word departure here is the same verb used in Greek to describe the launching of a ship out to sea. Paul's image of death is not the image of the end of a journey, but its beginning, a departure, a launching, the beginning of a new time and a more important voyage, in fact. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, when you know in your heart, like Paul knew in his heart, that your death is the beginning, not the end, It does make it easier, because it's hard, to take your eyes off yourself and instead direct your attention to those who come after you and to cheer them on from the finish line. Therefore, if you are young like Timothy, the word to you is to be bold. Stand up. Use the gifts that God has given you to carry out all the duties of your ministry. Don't wait until you have to do it. Don't wait until somebody else even asks you to do it or tells you to do it. Just do it. Has God been talking, tugging on your heart in some way? Has he been calling you to talk to someone or to serve someone or to share with someone? 
then go for it. That's Paul's encouragement to Timothy, and I think he would say the same thing to you today. Even when it's inconvenient, even if people brush you off at first, ex exert great patience and careful attention to, the, out, to carrying out the ministry that God has given to you. And then for you, those of you who are old, do you know who your spiritual sons and daughters are? Who are the young people that have been given the same spiritual gifts that God gave you. And if you don't know, that's okay. Just start seeking them out. Spend some serious time and effort establishing relationships with younger Christians until you find the sons and daughters that God has brought into this place and this time. And when you find them, cheer them on vigorously. There will be no golf claps in heaven. It won't be. It's not going to be like, good job. No, it's not going to be like that. It's shouts of joy. It's enthusiasm. So be bold in the way you encourage the young. Pursue your sons and daughters and charge them in the presence of God to get out there and use their God-given gifts. Give them the wisdom that God has taught you over the years of using yours so that they might find success and joy in the path that God has called them to. And if you're middle-aged, do both. <laughs> do both. Discharge all the duties of your ministry and cheer on your sons and daughters in the faith. For the race we run is not an individual event, it is a team event, a relay. Passing on your momentum to the racers who come after you is important. It is all part of the victory that we will share together at the end, when Jesus the judge gives us the crown of righteousness, and we all stand as one in his presence. Amen. Amen. Would you please bow with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this example from Paul, who's standing at the finish line, was cheering on his spiritual son, Timothy. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that whatever age we are, that you would help us in all the different stages of life to either, if we're young, to be bold and get out there and to do the things that you have gifted us to do. And if we are older and are approaching the time when we may be forced to lay down, being able to exercise some of the gifts in the way that we used to do, would you make us especially bold in pursuing younger Christians to finding our sons and daughters in the faith and to boldly encouraging them and giving them the charge so that we might all run our race with gladness and joy and to the fullest of our abilities so that on the last day we might together wear the one crown of victory, the crown of righteousness that comes from your son Jesus Christ, the judge. We pray this in his name. Amen. We're going to close this morning uh, by singing a hymn. We're going to sing hymn number 450. Psalm number 450, Lift High the Cross. Would you stand with me as we sing? Yeah.
So my fellow racers, may you recognize whatever stage of the race you're at, what it is that your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is calling you to do, whether it is to stand up and discharge all the duties of the ministry he has called you to, or whether it's to cheer others on with all your might as you approach the finish line. May you find joy in serving your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at every stage of the race. Go now in peace and serve your Lord Christ. Amen.